Buenas tardes, and welcome to another one of our historical discussions. This time, we're picking something particularly obscure, but I think we have good reason to discuss the Chilean Civil War. Well, obscure in English. Obscure in English, and you will be hard-pressed to find sources in English, so it takes quite a bit of digging to really get to know the Chilean Civil War, but, you know, for those of you that have been with us for multiple episodes, or if you're just joining us, we usually have a reason why we're discussing these very obscure topics, and I think we'll, uh, we'll explain ourselves why this matters, and why the world, uh, why the world cared about the Chilean Civil War. Um, and, yeah, particularly the, the legacy that it left, um, particularly in military history and naval military history uh, in particular. So, for those of, those of us that don't know a great deal about the Chilean Civil there War, I suppose... There can't be too many people who don't know about the Chilean Civil War. But for those few, we <laughs> should go over what the Chilean Civil War was. It essentially is the President Balmaceda uh, against the Congressionalists. And so the Congress forms a junta um, to fight Balmaceda, who is seen as a, a pseudo-dictator. He passes throughout his presidency from 1887 until 1891, when the Civil War breaks out. He um, does a lot of things that uh, are seen as against a lot of the powerful people in Chile, including the important... Uh, a lot of important aristocrats, the church, he is brought in as a moderate, but he clearly makes few friends um, in those, those early years of the presidency. And he, he inherits a Chile that has recently benefited from their war of the Pacific against, um, against the allied countries of Peru and Bolivia. And that's the Saltpeter War. Right. Um, to this day, if you want to insult a Bolivian, you say, uh, do you want to take a trip to the seashore? Because in 1884, <laughs> at the end of the war, Bolivia and their access to the Pacific yeah. was, uh, they became a landlocked country after Chile defeated them in the war and took... Uh, you know, the, the nitrate coast from yeah, it's Erica to the Antio worst Fagasta. thing they could possibly have done to Bolivia to, to cut off their sea access. Right. And the saltpeter, the um, sodium nitrate. All the nitratos. All of the. This is a boom economy for Chile. So their, their national revenues are, are flush. So the first country in South America to order a pre dreadnought battleship in the late 1880s. So who's so buying they, all of these nitratos? All these different nitrates, salt here? Uh, Europe and uh, the United States, because okay. it's used for two very important uh, functions. Um, it's the first readily available, it's still important to this day, as a fertilizer. And uh, the dry region in the Atacama Desert is particularly well suited for the preservation of natural nitrates. So this is just animal deposits that have piled up over millennia and millennia. And it's just like guano. nitrate. It is, it is guano, essentially. Oh. So it's, it's useful as a fertilizer. So in the late 19th century, you have exploding populations and you need to put nitrogen back into the soil to grow your crops. Otherwise your crops are gonna get depleted and you're gonna have mass starvation. So these nitrate clippers would go around the world, sailing around the Horn. This is pre-Panama Canal, loading up along the nitrate coast at Iquique or Antofagasta and sailing back to Europe with holds. The ships were made, nitrate clippers, the Germans made a lot of them, sailing ships. So there's no steam engine on them, just multiple mass sailing clippers full of, full of nitrate. It's also important for explosives. Saltpeter, of course, is necessary for um, black powder, but once you get towards the late 1880s, early 1890s, militaries are transitioning to smokeless propellants, so nitrocellulose-based propellant, and so you need nitrate for that. 
So there's very high demand for these nitrate products and Chile has not quite a monopoly on it, but a very large share of the global market. And so their revenues are high and they're, uh, they're experiencing a bit of a boom. So they order the, and they start expanding the Chile Navy, which unfortunately for Balmaceda would not go well for him. But he orders from uh, French and British shipyards very modern warships. The, the battleship Capitaine Pratt that they ordered was the first battleship, it was launched in 1890, it was the first battleship in the world to have electrically operated turrets. And people would be, most Americans um, and uh, people in, involved in Western history would probably balk at the idea of there being South American battleships, but we know from the very onset of the South American revolutions to mm -hmm. their civil wars that happened 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, to the War of the Pacific, the Navy is hugely it's important. Extremely important, just due to the geography yeah. of South America. So and, and Chile so is, is longer in distance from Mexico City to Winnipeg. Wow. And it's this narrow, long country, so naval forces are particularly important. Yeah. Just the natural geography of a... Uh, and we see uh, ironclads in the War of the Pacific. Right, the, the famous uh, Husakar yeah. that the, the Peruvian Navy had. And in 1879, the Chilean, um, the new Chilean warships that they had ordered, um, one of them was the Blanco Encalada, captured the Husakar, which still exists. You can go to Chile today and tour the ironclad Husakar that they have yep. restored. Um, three captains died on the deck of that ship from multiple different flags wow. <laughs> over the course of yeah. its history. But uh, the Chilean naval power was absolutely decisive in the War of the Pacific. But when you get to 1890, um, the Chilean Congress starts to have profound domestic policy disagreements with President Balmaceda. Both of them are claiming that the Constitution is on their side. Balmaceda wants to appoint ministers, and there's a, accusations of corruption because these were his friends. Yeah. And he wants to appoint ministers of government without congressional approval because the Congress disagrees with him and they would block his appointments. And he says, I don't need congressional yeah. approval to ratify my appointments. And technically he was right. The Constitution, it's, it doesn't say, it's kind of like the Constitution doesn't say of the United States that uh, a state can secede, but the Confederate States said, well, if it doesn't say we can't, then we can. So President Balmaceda argued that the Constitution didn't prohibit him from appointing ministers, although for decades since the Constitution had been um, had been written in Chile, all of the presidents had gotten Congress to approve their ministers. It was more yeah. of a tradition or a, um, just what was expected. Yeah. So he bucks the tradition and um, he's the straw that breaks the camel back is the budget for 1891 because the Congress Which is the budget uses, of 1890. Right, he says, <laughs> all we're going to do, he says, this is very simple. If Congress will not come and ratify my ministers and they won't come and ratify the budget, he simply announces that the budget for 1891 for the Republica de Chile is exactly the same as the budget of 1890. Brilliant. And, well, is this how how is this legal in Congress? Yeah. You can't just say last year's budget is this year's budget and not get congressional approval. So it finally comes to an absolute uh, loggerhead in uh, Santiago, and the congressionalist faction, the faction that supports the Congress, uh, leaves Santiago, goes to Valparaiso, the traditional base of the Chilean yeah. Navy, and boards the ships, and uh, and on January 16th, 1891, the uh, Blanco Encalada, the same ship that had captured the Husakar, fires the first shot of the Chilean Civil War in Valparaiso. 
Now, as it happens, the Congressionalist side had a majority of the naval officers, yeah. whereas the army remained loyal for the most part to uh, President Balmaceda. So in January 1891, you've got a navy without an army, and, and an army, an army without, without a navy. navy. Now, under most other circumstances, and in most other countries, well, if you had an army, if you control the land, but you don't control the sea, uh, you can still control the land. But Chile is so unique because it's narrow. And, and you can't you, march your army anywhere. Right, you you cannot, yeah, Sydney good luck Navy. marching your army the equivalent from, uh, you know, Mexico City to Winnipeg yeah. to go, uh, because the, the rebels, the Congressionalist rebels, immediately go north. You know, the obvious thing to do, they land in Iquique, which is part of the territory that they had taken from Bolivia in the War of the Pacific. It's the nitrate region. So they take control of that very small garrison there of... Uh, and ironically, Balmaceda had spent a great deal of money on guns and fortifications for the shore there, for Iquique. And among other things, he had a huge spending racket throughout his entire presidency where the, the contracts go to friends more than, uh, more than anyone else. But the intent was to have all these shore batteries and brand new European artillery. Oh yeah, they move up to Iquique. Yeah, because it's incredibly strategic. And when yeah. you're in a one-trick pony economy, yeah. you know, it's all about the nitrato. But uh, and congressionalists yeah. take it very easily. Um, because again, Balmaceda has got his 30,000 man army. Fairly modern, it's, it's probably the best army in South America. In, uh, in 1891, but there's no railroad connection uh, from Santiago Valparaiso area, which is in the south center of Chile, to the northern nitrate region. Everything goes by sea yeah. because the geography of Chile is such that the Andes, to get from Santiago to Antofagasta in the nitrate region, you have to cross the ridge of the Andes twice if you go by land. Yeah. So it's just cheaper, faster to go by sea. And the Chilean Congress controls that. So you have President Balmaceda with the most powerful army that's useless to him. And the Congressionalists with the Navy can almost at their leisure start raising an army up in the north. Uh, they established the, the junta in April yeah. of 91 and start bringing in volunteers, uh, including our, uh, there's a reason we put the pickle halba out here. Well, there's a lot of distinction with, with the pickle halba because it's, it's the last vestige of the Prussian army today is in Chile. Mm -hmm. But um, there's that German heritage, or Prussian heritage at the time, um, that's the military advisors to Chile. Mm -hmm. So they still use the pickle halba. But um, yeah, that's the legacy of of uh, the German captain. He was only a captain in the Prussian army. So well, you know, Hauptmann. So 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 was von Steuben. <laughs> He's just a captain. He goes. Is, the captains go a long way. Cap captains know captain, a lot of things. Captain is not a big deal, and I speak captains with authority. Captains know a lot of things, though. <laughs> He's a captain. It's not like he's a colonel. He's not a field marshal. Okay. He's a captain, Emil Kerner. Yeah. And he comes um, to train the tiny infant army of the Chilean Congress at the up at Iquique. And the Chilean Congress also send purchasing agents to Europe, and they they buy um, modern they can. rifles and have them sent. But uh, Emil Kerner, all he knows, he's a German officer, so he knows Prussian drill, yeah. Prussian training. And to this day, the stamp he left on the Chilean army is, you know, it's, it's been called the last of the Prussian yeah. armies. They, they still keep those traditions alive because of him, yeah. this, this Prussian captain. But they go try to get European arms. They import, they import success. yeah. They they import French rifles and they import um, manlishers. So it's um, and and I believe Balmaceda's army mostly had 
French rifles. They would have primarily had the old Gras yeah. rifle, the single shot, pull tag, and fire a metallic cartridge. Whereas the, day, the Congressionalists had just started buying magazine rifles. Right, not very many, but they okay. did have them, and they were an enormous advantage okay. over the, the black powder, the old black powder rifles, which, but if you've got a three to one numerical advantage, you know, probably wouldn't matter. Yeah. The problem for Balmaceda is he's got the army, but he can't move the army anywhere. And he, because if he tries to defend his coast, you know, the old, you know, Prussians say, you know, wer verteidigt alles, you know, verteidigt das nicht. If you try to defend everything, you can't you defend, defend nothing. You defend nothing. So he has to keep his army centered around uh, Santiago and Valparaiso. Valparaiso is the main port yeah. for Santiago. It's connected by rail. And that's where he is focused while the Congressionalists with naval supremacy are able to load small amounts of their troops, brand new raised troops, and come down the coast of Chile taking uh, crucial ports. And Balmaceda does not know where they're going to land, so he can't spare his force trying to hold everything. So the Congressionalists start working their way south, taking these important ports, and President Balmaceda with his army just has to sit there and shake his fists in frustration. But he gets something. Something arrives He's holding in the out. nick of time. There's a pair of Torpedo cruisers. Torpedoras. Torpedoras, as the Chileans call them. They're about 700 ton ancestors of, of what would eventually evolve into what we would call today a destroyer. Yeah. But in 1890, no ship had ever been sunk in war except for a dubious claim in the Russo Turkish War that I don't believe. But in 1890, no warship had ever been sunk by a modern torpedo, what we would call a torpedo. Yeah. So a device that's got its own engine and gyroscopes in it that uh, self-propels itself into a, a ship, a modern torpedo. Yeah. So these cruisers, torpedo cruisers, they're too large to be called torpedo boats and they're too small to be called a cruiser. Torpedo, they're torpedo cruisers. And no one really knew what the future was going to be in terms of torpedo ships. It was... Uh, you know, there hadn't been a naval action, modern European naval action, since uh, Lisa in 1866. So yeah. everyone's kind of guessing. But these are small, fast ships, and they have three torpedo tubes on them. And President Balmaceda manages to uh, crew them and take them from the British shipyards. They take them all the way around the Cape Horn and uh, arrive at Valparaiso in April. And so he sends them on a, well, the, the c commander of one of the Almirante Lynch, were, the names were Almirante Lynch and Almirante Condell, named after Chilean, European yes. admirals yeah. that had served earlier in the Chilean Navy. And that's, that's kind of the tradition of a lot of the South There's American so many names. names. The Lynch, Congressionalists have O'Higgins. O'Higgins, Cochrane, yeah. Lynch, Condell, yeah. all these mostly transplanted Irishmen. Yep. But uh, Cochrane is a, you know, Sir Cochrane was a British lord yeah. who was instrumental in the establishment of the Chilean Navy in the 1830s. And President Balmaceda uh, is briefed by the commander of one of these torpedo cruisers about staging a surprise attack on the congressional fleet. And Balmaceda says, go for it. So in April of 1891, these torpedo cruisers steam north to Caldera Bay, where the congressionalists had recently landed. They were using their naval supremacy that they thought they had to move troops and land basically at their pleasure. And the uh, Chilean, the Congressionalist Central Battery Ironclad, Blanco Encalada, the same one that had taken the Husakar, uh, was there in, uh, in Caldera Bay when these 
torpedo cruiser around four in the morning come in. And the officers of the ship, for the most part, were ashore. Um, and they had, the only watch on the ship was seven men were on watch on the Blanco Encalada at the time. And the ship's captain was just asleep in his cabin. No torpedo nets, no particular lookout. The batteries around the city had not been on alert. It was complete surprise, and the Congressionalists thought that we have nothing to fear. And these two torpedo cruisers came sliding in, and they launched a whole bunch of torpedoes at the Blanco and Colada. And one of them, well, two of them hit. One of them was a dud. But it, the first torpedo that hit didn't explode because the uh, Chilean crew member on the torpedo cruiser forgot to pull out the safety wire so that it prevented the torpedo from arming. But it punctures the hull of the Blanco Enclada and floods the dynamo room. This is where the electricity is generated yeah. for the ship. So the whole ship just goes black in an instant. And about 30, 40 seconds later, the second torpedo hits. This one explodes, blows an eight foot hole in the side of the ship and it sinks within about a minute and takes 140 men down with her. Um, and her captain survived because they had animals kept there for food, including llamas. And he grabbed hold of the wool of a llama and it swam him to shore. So that's how you couldn't make you can't that up. make it up. That is insane. <laughs> that, that is absolutely fascinating, but so Chilean. <laughs> yeah, the llama. Just, just, just how did he survive? Grabbed hold of a llama. So that is an important battle in in terms of the in naval warfare in the eighteen nineties because everyone is looking at that and saying, right. "Wow." Torpedoes can do this. And a tiny little, a cheap, small torpedo boat yeah. can launch one of these, um, they were called whitehead torpedoes after the British inventor. This, is, this device will deliver high explosive below the waterline. No amount of armor protection can help you against a torpedo. And it even capital Six. ships are right. now and, uh, uh, and that's vulnerable. What Blanco Encolada was. It was a central battery ironclad frigate and it had very heavy armor around its central battery. By 1891, it was trending obsolescent, but not so much. Um, there were a lot of similar ships in European navies still at the time, central battery ships. And the thought that a tiny little torpedo boat could... Uh, sink your extremely expensive capital ships in shockwaves. And now we'll need very fast torpedo boat destroyers right. or destroyers to uh, counter counteract that. And torpedo boats. But, um, and, and we have to steer away from the old adage with, uh, that we've, we're soon to talk about with Hampton Roads is the Chileans didn't invent torpedo attacks. But this is yeah. the first time the people are looking at that and that is affecting naval policy. So just like when the Monitor and the Merrimack met, the, we didn't, the Americans did not invent the ironclad, but it's the first time that it happens in a battle that people are watching. And so it's the, that, it's profound Caldera Bay and the Chilean Civil War is profound for that very reason that it affects naval policy. Now a tiny torpedo boat, relatively tiny torpedo boat, can destroy a capital ship. And it's, now you need to yeah. shift. There's a whole shift. Well, it proves the principle. That's all it does. Because Whitehead torpedoes have been around since 1866. Yeah. And the fact was the Habsburgs that yes. were were among the first to go, ooh, because they're always <laughs> looking for ways to have a navy on the cheap. Yeah, they need the force <laughs> multiplier. So, but they've been around for decades, yeah. and they had been launched at war before, but one of them had never hit another ship. And, and not in this fashion. Not, not, in a, not in a way that 
you know, a surprise attack a smaller ship against a large ship. Yeah, but it also begs the question, you know, grist for the counterfactual historian's mill. What if the Blanco Encalada had been on high alert? What if their guns were manned? What if the batteries were manned? Mm -hmm. Would they have been able to stop these torpedoras? Yeah. Um, and if they did, would there be would there right, be no no destroyers everywhere? Yeah, these torpedoes are useless. We're yeah. gonna stick with capital ships. But yeah. No, it went down, and uh, and the wreck stayed there until the fifties, when the Chileans dynamited it to build a bridge. I guess they don't really have much of a thought for war graves. Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> I wonder if there's any llama, an llama bones down there too. Must have been an but, important bridge. It's the llama connection is absolutely hilarious to me. Also, minor South American connection is the Balmaceda names his successor, and his successor's name is Vicuña. And, and Vicuña is the, the tiny wild alpaca, you know, the, with the hugely expensive wool. But uh, that, that's so South American. The llamas and vicuñas. But that was one of the, the Caldera Bay was the high water mark, I guess you could say, of President Balmaceda's side. Because the Chilean Congress still had naval supremacy and the torpedoes uh, that he had, that they launched in this battle, he had no way of getting any more because they were made in England and the, the sh Torpedoras only had eight of them, okay. and they launched every single one in the that battle was of the Calgary. That was it. They, they shot their bolt, so to speak. Um, and the Congressionalists had the sister ship of the Blanco Encalada, which is the Cochrane. Yeah. They had the relatively new cruiser, 1881 cruiser, called the Esmeralda, which was the most powerful ship that they had. And they had the old ironclad uh, Husakar and some smaller supporting ships. So they still had naval supremacy. And so the loss of the Blanco and Colada did not prevent them from landing in August uh, north of, <coughs> excuse me, north of uh, Valparaiso at, uh, at Kong Kong. They do their landing there, the undefended port, yeah. a harbor, sheltered harbor, do their landing there and then start marching south. So Balmaceda sends his troops out to stop them. There's a series of decisive battles the Congressionalists win. Because at this point, Balmaceda has essentially been blockaded for five, six months. Yeah. His money's no good. Uh, he's paying his soldiers. He used to pay them in silver. The treasury ran dry. Now he's paying them in paper. And the inflation is skyrocketing, desertion is increasing, and um, so these battles are not quite foregone conclusions, but the Chilean congressional troops have all the morale, they have all the, the elan, yeah. um, and they have Manglicher magazine rifles yeah. with smokeless powder. So they're enthusiastically charging forward, and these shaky Balmacidas troops, whose heart isn't really in the fight anymore, are quick to retreat or surrender. So they, um, towards the end of August, there's the yeah, decisive battles. And there are battles. entire units that join the Congressionalists after the uh, after the after these battles. Oh yeah, just they, they switch, surrender, switch but then they also mm -hmm. they're not prisoners of war. They're just joining the Congressionalists. So they move. Uh, south to the final battle of La Placia, the final defeat of Balmaceda. That was August 28, 1891. And three days later, they marched into Santiago. So President Balmaceda, you know, his, he's having his downfall moment, yeah. we could say. He runs and hides in the Argentine embassy in Santiago. And the, he knew the Argentines. I mean, they had, he had a long political career before his presidency and he was apparently credited with um, keeping the Argentines out of the War of the Pacific. So they knew him, he was expecting asylum, um, and then he just holds up in the embassy. 
until September 18th, which is the national day of Chile, yeah. when he shoots himself. Well, I guess he's not a, that great of a success if the national day of Chile is when he shoots himself. What a day. Well, we'll see that. But he was holding out for for some other foreign construction, was he not? What other what other ships were could have well he had could the, have come the out. Capitaine Pratt in being built in France. Yeah. And if he had gotten hold of that, it, it would have uh, instantly given him naval supremacy because that one ship by itself was superior to the entire and He had ordered that before the war. Right. And the French were building it, and then what happened during the war? Well, it was still under construction, and the French were... Uh, he had no way of getting a crew there to take it. It needed 450 men okay. to crew that ship. Um, he had two smaller cruisers being built in France also. He tried to send one of them before it was complete, because he only needed 150 men for that. Yeah. And he took it before it was complete, and he tried to buy British guns, um, and they were going to rendezvous at sea and install the guns, but the war ended before that could happen. Terrible. But if he had gotten those ships, the two protected cruisers, the Presidente Pinto class protected cruisers, and if he had gotten the Capitaine Pratt, it would have been game over. So yeah. the, if the war had started six months later, um, instead of the you know parliamentary period in Chilean history, yeah. which goes until like the twenties, nineteen twenty-five. Yeah, they call it the pseudo parliamentary <laughs> period. It would have been the Balmacidist yeah. period of ex, you know executive might have had, power. Might have had the empire of Chile. You know, it, and there are uh, many historians who believe that Balmaceda, um, in in terms of business and modernization would have been, it's, it's a controversial topic, yeah. but there are historians who argue that Balmaceda was better for Chile than the, the kind of heel-dragging... Well, his spending seemed insane, but it was all well, beneficial the money, to Chile. They had the money for it, yeah. they were, they, you know, it's the boom. Yeah. The South American economy, Brazil and Argentina also had these boom cycles with uh, like rubber for uh, Brazil, rubber and coffee where they're making inordinate amounts of money and they um, spend it all and then they have a bust cycle. Yes. <laughs> Just a pendulum swing. But what do you spend it on? But yeah, the after the war, with um, with Balmaceda gone, there is this fear of, per, of presidential power. So we call it the pseudo-parliamentary period because it's the legislature is an absolute check on presidential power, and the president is basically a figurehead until the 1920s. Yeah, it's just like that sign here, yeah. El Presidente. Yeah. And you, would, <laughs> you would think that Chileans would be forever afraid of uh, dictatorial type leaders, but um, you know, then we have Pinochet. And, yeah, 70 uh, years later, though. 70 like years later. They, 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 they didn't forget. But, but they're still Prussian. They're still Prussian, and they still have and you can still see the uh, ironclads right in uh, in Chile. So the Chilean Civil War matters. It's not just a uh, an obscure historical event. It influences uh, naval policy, naval architecture for you know the next twenty years, which are pivotal years because that's what leads up to World War One. And you could say that the Chilean Civil War influences what the navies of the world are bringing to the Great War. And it also just drives home with, you know, a, a sledgehammer force, uh, the importance of naval power. Yeah, it's, again, it's by, made, by, yeah. by every metric, Balmaceda had everything. He had the money, he had the men, he had the guns, he had control of the capital, he had control of the government, he had control of foreign affairs. The only thing the Congressionalists had in January of 1891 were four somewhat outdated warships. That's all they had, and they won the war with uh, naval power. Yep. And it's coincidental that, uh, that Mahan's... The, influence of sea power on history.
published in 1890. So at the same time as this, this highly influential book is published, you've got the Chilean Civil War that just, as if on order, absolutely confirms all of his theories yeah. that naval power is so incredibly important and when you have it you can go where you please strike where you please because they have a navy to quote uh, Lawrence of Arabia <laughs> <laughs> but it's true and they demonstrated that now Chile is a unique example because of its coastline it's it's a country of coast so the navy is of more importance there it's, it's blown out of proportion of importance uh, for a country like Chile as opposed to most other countries but it just drives home the point that control of the sea in this modern era of uh, international commerce with steamships carrying the commerce of the world you know on iron keels he who controls the navy controls the world and that is you know, the british empire's hegemony through the royal navy for almost 120 30 years it's because they had control of the sea and they could go where they please strike where they please land soldiers where they please and you could have a very large army you know, World War I is a perfect example. The blockade of Germany in World War I. There are parallels with the Chilean Civil War and the, the President Balmaceda yeah. being deprived access to the sea. He couldn't get any supplies. No he, couldn't get, your army he couldn't get more torpedoes. He couldn't even get crews sent to go take over the ships waiting for him in France, yeah. including the, the Capitaine Pratt. That had to be incredibly frustrating. Brand new battleship, right? Yeah, sitting there just waiting for you, yep. and you can't... Well, the French also weren't really inclined to give it to them. No. They no, wanted it... to see how this would pan out. No. In fact, there are uh, different powers supporting the Congress uh, most of the time. There's, there's English uh, um, support, there's, um, of course, the, the, the Germans, and then... There's an incident with, an, with um, I believe, a Balmacidist ship that has weapons in the United States. And they, the, the Itada, yeah. which was actually going to the Congressionalists. Oh, it was going to the Congressionalists, yeah, they okay. Bought, uh, they bought 5,000 rifles from uh, Remington Repeating Arms ah. Company. And Remington is like, oh yeah, sure, we'll take your money. Yeah. And they shipped these rifles to Los Angeles. The, the Pueblo of Los Angeles, which yes. is not, not exactly a boom town in 1890, but it's a you know, growing port. And they load these weapons on the Chilean steamer Itara. And the They're US, told they can't leave. The U.S. Navy stops them because private citizens providing arms to a foreign country was a violation of the Neutrality Act even though the sympathies of the United States was with the Congressionalists. Yeah. And they, they post a guard on board, and they leave with the guard. They take the, uh, their you know, sentinel with them, and they go down uh, towards the coast of Chile, and I, I guess they don't get overhauled until they're almost there, I think it was and, the, and told to turn around. I think it was the USS New York that stopped them, but I'm not. Really? I, I don't remember. But uh, it gets overhauled and sent right back. Yeah. Almost. Which is uh, similar things would happen in 1898, or before 1898, with these filibuster expeditions trying to make it to Cuba. Filibusteros, <laughs> yep. We should talk about that someday. Someday. So anything else to add about the Chilean Civil War? We might hear about it again when we discuss the ram. Yes, because as we've learned from various naval battles, the lesson you take away isn't always the right answer. I guess you could say that the torpedo does the same job as a ram, but you can launch it at something. And you can leave. Because it makes a very big hole below the waterline yeah. very quickly 
but you don't have to actually crash your ship into them to do it. <laughs> yeah, tell that to Ted Kethel. <laughs> yeah. He would have, uh, he he would have liked some white hair yes. torpedoes. I, think. I know, yeah. I know. So, well, but that's for another episode. So thank you for joining us on the Chilean Civil War. One of the uh, more obscure topics we've discussed, but I think uh, a, fairly, uh, a fairly interesting one and a, a pretty influential part of military history. This is the only video in English on YouTube in the Chilean Civil War that's not in a robot voice. For now. For now. now. Yeah, all of our copycats are going to yes. go up there. I know. We're trendsetters. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah.